Okay, so today we're going to begin kind of a new uh, topic, and that is we're going to discuss uh, bounded cohomology for a little bit. And and then I'll hopefully be able to tie in some of the ideas between bounded cohomology with, with what we've been done. But at least for the beginning, uh, for this lecture, maybe it's, um, well, we'll see how far we get. Uh, but what is uh, bounded cohomology? Uh, so here we have, this is going to be with general coefficients. So we have gamma a group now. And we have uh, B a Banach space. And we're going to suppose that we have an isometric action. Action of gamma on this bonding space. So this is going to be the input data for us. And then what can we do? We can consider this uh, chain complex. So where we consider B and we take this map uh, delta one and this sends it to uh, functions, uh, but this is bounded cohomology, so I'm going to want all my functions to be bounded. So L infinity of gamma taking values in B, and we're going to define this new map delta 2. It's going to be L taking L infinity functions from gamma times gamma, taking values in B, and etc. Uh, and this is where we're going to define delta k of a function. So uh, this should be a function on k minus one variables. And when we plug in delta k, we should get a function on k variables. So let me tell you what that is. This is equal to t1 times f of t2, t3, et cetera, tk, uh, minus f of T1, T2, and then T3, Tk. And then plus, we alternate signs. And here we have f of T1. And then we do the multiplication T2 times T3. And then we keep uh, going until we get to uh, plus negative 1 to the, uh, say, k minus 1, f t1, t2, f2, t k minus 1 times tk, and then plus negative 1 times k, f t1, t2, t k minus 1, and then we just drop the tk from this. All right, so this is this. Uh, co-boundary operator. And then uh, what you notice, so this is a linear, a linear map. Um, it's also a bounded map because there are only a certain number of terms, only a finite number of terms here. So it's bounded by k plus one or something like this. So it's a bounded linear map between these Bonnock spaces. And, uh, and then we just defined work and also remember, so this first term, this is where we used to multiplicate the isometric action on the Bonnock space is just right here, T1 times that. And then the observation, uh, and I'll leave this to you guys to check, is that uh, if we take this co-boundary operator, delta K times delta K minus one, uh, this is the zero operator. So in other words, the image of one of these maps into the kernel of the next. Uh, and so then we can define these cohomology spaces. So HK, uh, let me make sure I'm getting the indices right here. Uh, well, HK of gamma with values in B is defined to be the uh, kernel of one of these modulo the image of K 
this one. Okay, uh, let's see. So H1 should be Uh, yeah, I think that looks right. So this is the, uh, and this I'll put a subscript B here because these are all bounded functions. So if there were, if we just considered all functions, this would be the usual cohomology, but here we're considering bounded functions. So this is bounded cohomology. Okay. So this is the definition. Uh, maybe we can do one example and that will also make me know with my if my indices match up all right uh, let's go ahead and consider h1 and see what that is so h1 is the kernel of uh delta one oh yeah so i see probably my indices are not matched up so probably this should be okay plus one so let's see what h1 is uh, so H1, so some function C uh, in the kernel of, of, yeah, so key is, if C is in the kernel of delta two, so C is a function of one variable in the group. So what does it mean to be in the kernel of delta two? Uh, so this is if and only if. Well, let's compute what this is. So we want zero to be delta two of C evaluated on any two points S and T. And we just compute what this is. So this is S times delta uh, or S times C of T minus C times ST plus CS. So I want this to be equal to zero. So if we move CST to the other side, so we see IE, this is the same as saying CST is equal to SCT plus CS. And this is for all S and T in general. So that's what it means to be in the kernel of delta two. And we've seen this before. This is what we call the one co-cycle. Uh, so now we see it fits in this general picture. Uh, and what does it mean to be in the image of delta one? So if we have some v in v, so we think of these as functions on zero variables, the coefficients here. Uh, so then what is delta one of b? So delta one b, so this is a function of one variable t, and it's exactly t times the function of zero variables, that's b, minus, and then we have uh, the function of zero variables b. So this is the co-boundary. So this is the inner co-cycle. Uh, so we see exactly what is h1. h1 we've seen before. Well, we've seen it before without bounded. So h1b uh, of gamma with values in b. These are, uh, this is exactly bounded one co-cycles. Bounded one cycles modulo inner cycles. Now we proved we did one example earlier in the semester of a relationship between bounded cosec bounded one cycles and inner one cycles. And that is uh, so note if B is a Hilbert space, so then we proved earlier in the semester that bounded one co-cycles were the same as inner one co-cycles. So in this case, we get that H1 bounded co-cycles into value B is just a zero space. All right, so for Hilbert spaces, this this is not particularly interesting. And there's more generalizations beyond Hilbert space. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, so for Hilbert spaces, it's not particularly interesting, um, but for spaces in general, it is interesting because you can characterize amenability in terms of bounded one cohomology. 
So maybe that's the first uh, thing we can prove here. So here's the theorem. I believe this is due to Johnson in the um, late 60s, early 70s. And that is that uh, group gamma is amenable if and only if, uh, oh, first let me give a definition. And that is, so here's a definition. So if, uh, if we have some, if B is a gamma module, so is a Bonnach gamma module. So by this, I mean that if we have an isometric action of gamma on a Bonnach space, that's what I mean by Bonnach module. So then we say, that this is a dual Bonnach module, Bonnach gamma module, if B is isomorphic to the dual of some other Bonnach space, which I'll denote by B subsets bar, uh, and if the action is dual to some action on the pre-dual, and is a dual if this and if the action of gamma on B is dual to the action of gamma on B. All right, so the first thing I'll say about this definition is it's a terrible definition, but it's, uh, but it's the common definition. It's terrible in the sense that, uh, so we shouldn't say that B is a dual uh, uh, Bonnach gamma module because the pre-dual is actually part of the data here. So uh, when what we really mean to say is B together with a distinguished pre-dual is a dual Bonnach gamma module. But it's cumbersome to write out the pre-dual because of course Bonnach spaces could have more than one pre-dual. Uh, and it's cumbersome to write this out each time. So whenever I say B is a dual Bonnach gamma module, that means that there is a distinguished pre-dual that we're specifying, but I won't just write it out explicitly. So that's the remark I'll make. Okay, so now let's give the theorem uh, about amenability. So the theorem is gamma is amenable if and only if uh, for every dual Bonnet gamma module B, we have that the bounded cohomology of gamma with values in B is trivial. So we saw if we took B to be a Hilbert space and for arbitrary groups, this was always trivial. Uh, but as soon as your group is not amenable, there are some other Bonnach space, uh, even dual Bonnach spaces um, where this is non-trivial. And if it's, uh, and if when it's amenable though, it's always trivial. So every, every bounded one co-cycle is inner characterizes amenable groups, uh, at least when you look at dual Bonnach. Uh, so let's give a proof. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider this space here X, which is going to be the set of uh, linear functionals on L infinity of X. Uh, so linear functionals such that P of one is equal to zero. Uh, so this is going to be my dual Bonnach space. Uh, why did I write X? This, this should be gamma. And maybe I should write B since I already introduced B above. So let me write this as B. So this is going to be our Bonnach space. Uh, now this is a dual Bonnach space. That's because of course the, here we have L infinity and then it's going to be some annihilator 
some dual of this annihilator here. So this will be a dual Banach space. And we have a natural gamma action on it, which is the gamma axon L infinity by left translation, and hence the dual action axon B. So this is a dual, uh, this is a dual uh, gamma, uh, dual bonic. Now it's kind of a horrendous space because L infinity itself as a bonic space is already non-separable. So this is the dual of some non-separable bonic space. So this is, you know, uh, a pretty unruly, unruly space, uh, but it is a dual bonic space. And then what can we do? We can define a co-cycle. So we define uh, C mapping gamma to B by uh, co-cycle uh, co at some T is just going to be uh, a value, it's going to be the Dirac function at T minus the Dirac function at the identity. All right, so this is certainly a natural linear functional on L infinity of gamma. Uh, it's even a normal linear functional. Um, so it's in the pre dual. And it uh, gives zero when you plug in um, the constant one function. So this lives in our space. And it's also easy to see that this is a co cycle. Uh, why is that easy to see? Well, it's actually an inner co-cycle in a slightly larger space. So if we didn't restrict to the subspace, then it would be inner. Um, because, uh, so it is given by T times the Dirac function of E minus the Dirac function of E. But the point is, is that the Dirac function of E is not in our space B. So this is inner in a larger space. So in particular, it's certainly a co-cycle. Uh, and now I want to say, so the claim is that uh, if gamma is non-amenable, this will not be inner, and hence it uh, gives half the proof of this. Okay, so if, so in other words, we're, we'll prove that if this is an inner co-cycle, then the group is amenable. So if this is inner, so then there exists some uh, phi in B such that uh, C of T is equal to uh, T times phi minus phi. Well, like I said, this is already T times the Dirac function at the identity minus the Dirac function at the identity. So subtracting these two things, uh, we get that therefore uh, phi minus the Dirac function at the identity is fixed by gamma. Um, so here we have a gamma invariant linear functional on L infinity. So this is an L infinity of gamma dual. But what can we do? What do we know? We know this is non-zero. Uh, so this is not equal to zero because phi is not the Dirac function because phi is in B. And the Dirac function is not, isn't in B. So this is a non-zero uh, gamma invariant linear functional. And then of course we could take the real part and that gives, or the imaginary part, and that, that'll give us a, one of those will give us a non-zero linear functional, which is, uh, which is symmetric. And then we can take the Hahn decomposition. So taking the real or imaginary uh, part, we get a symmetric gamma invariant linear functional uh, that is non-zero since either the real or imaginary part has to be non-zero. Uh, and then taking 
the Han decomposition gives a non-zero uh, gamma invariant uh, positive uh, linear functional. So showing gamma is amenable. All right, because amenable amenability was characterized by the existence of a gamma invariant state on L infinity. And uh, here we have, yeah, again, this is non-zero. So you can normalize it to be a state. All right, so that shows that uh, if you're not amenable, then there's some dual Banach uh, gamma module which has non-trivial bounded cohomology. And now we're going to prove the, uh, so this proves, you know, uh, that proves this direction. And now we're going to prove the other direction. Uh, I'll have to go on to the next page. So now we're going to show that if gamma is amenable, then every dual Banach gamma module, the cohomology is trivial. So now, suppose now that gamma is amenable. And C mapping gamma to B is a bounded co-cycle. into a dual uh, Banach gamma module. Uh, so we've seen uh, this sort of argument before when we were showing that um, uh, bounded co-cycles are inner for values in Hilbert spaces. What did we do? We considered uh, take the set C to be the closed, this is the weak star closed convex hole. So B is a dual Banach space, so it has a weak star topology. Uh, we're going to take the weak closed convex hole of the range of the co-cycle here. So this is how we showed, so the observation is we, we took this C and this is, uh, yeah. Well, I'll just write it out again. Uh, so what can we do? We, this is a non-empty, weak star, uh, compact since it's bounded. So notice this is bounded. And hence it's weak star compact. Hence weak star compact by Banach Uh So here's a non-empty, convex, weak star compact subset and we're going to define a natural affine action of our group on this set. So we define a, a weak star continuous affine action of gamma on C by, well, I'll just define it on this, uh, said C, uh, well, no, I define it in general. So S times a vector C is defined to be S times C uh, plus C of S. Where S is just the usual Banach space action. And then uh, you have to check that this is indeed uh, Banach, uh, so this is indeed an, a weak star continuous, uh, I guess that weak star continuous is obvious because it's a dual Banach space and that's the only uh, point there. So it's certainly weak star continuous. It's also certainly affine, it preserves convex combinations. <clears throat> so that's affine. Uh, and so to check that it actually maps C back into C, so that's something we should check. And so there, since it's, it's weak star continuous and affine, it just is, suffic is sufficient to show that it takes the image of this here. So what happens when we look at C times C of T? <clears throat> so this is this new affine action. Well, this is defined as SCT 
plus CS, and that's just CST, right, which is again NC. So it maps these points back into C, but therefore it maps any convex combination back into C, and hence anything in the closure of the convex combination. So we get that therefore uh, this action maps C into C. <clears throat> All right, so we have a weak star continuous affine isometric or sorry, weak star continuous affine action of gamma on a uh, convex compact subset. So Kakutani's theorem for abelian groups are, uh, in general, this is a characterization of amenable groups that there exists a fixed point. So since gamma is amenable, there is a fixed point. Uh, let's call it uh, eta. But what does it mean to be a fixed point? So it just means that eta is equal to s times eta, which is s eta plus the cocycle at s. So i.e. the cocycle at s is just eta minus s eta. So it's inner. All right, so that's just rephrasing. Any questions about that? All right, so at least one bounded one cohomology is useful in regards to amenability versus non-amenability. But I'm gonna be interested in bounded cohomology specifically with values in Hilbert space, which we know always vanish, the bounded one cohomology always vanishes. So I'm gonna be interested there, therefore in bounded two cohomology. So we need to uh, discuss that a little bit. Oh, well, maybe uh, I'll put a remark. And that is that bounded cohomology is uh, fairly mysterious in general. Uh, so for instance, it's an open problem. Uh, it is unknown if H4 bounded four cohomology of a free group with values in the reals, uh, so just the trivial Banach space. Um, it's unknown if four or four and higher, so unknown if this is not equal to zero or is equal to zero uh, for any n greater than equal to four. So that tells you something about how how you know much there is unknown about bounded cohomology that for free groups usually these are the things that you can compute cohomology fairly easily uh, but for this it's known that uh, for n equals one of course it's zero because we can compute that for n equals two and three it's known to be non-zero and that's all that's known about bounded cohomology for free group and that's with coefficients in the trivial representation so just uh, just the trivial action on the, on the reals. So that's just three. Um, all uh, Yeah, so now I wanna start talking a little bit about uh, bounded two cohomology. But to do that, I wanna, uh, Yeah, let me first talk about quasi cocycles. So here's another definition. So uh, again, here be a uh, Banach gamma module. So a map Q from gamma to B is a quasi cocycle if uh, for all s uh, so if there exists some constant if there exists some constant greater than zero 
such that for all S and T in gamma, uh, we have that if we look at the cosine correlation, that is QST uh, minus SQT, uh, and then so if we look at what, what we want it to be, no, hold on, I need something wrong here. Uh, we want QST, so this should be, if we're a genuine cocycle, this would be SQT minus QS. So if we look at the how far away, how far away we are, we want this to be uniformly bounded in S and T. So it's a co-cycle up to this bounded error. So that's the definition of a quasi co-cycle. Um, but the remark here is that we have another way of viewing a quasi co-cycle. And now what is, what are we just right here? This is nothing but uh, delta one of Q applied to ST. And so what do we have? We see that a quasi cycle is, uh, so for the same result, Q is not here, Q here is not defined to be bounded. Uh, Q could be unbounded, but we still can do the same computation we did before to notice that delta two applied to delta one of Q has to be equal to zero. So therefore we get that this delta one of Q is an element, is a two cycle. This this error as a function of two variables is a two cycle. So this is um, uh, I mean plus uh, uh, yeah this this should be plus. So this is a thank you. Um, so if it were cocycle, we'd want this to be zero. So that's the formula we want. Uh, in the parentheses, I mean, plus, uh, this is what happens when we're, okay. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, right, we want to see how far away is from this. And this is exactly the, this boundary uh, operator applied to this Q, where Q is an unbounded function, but it happens to land in the bounded functions. So in other words, uh, what do we have is that we obtain, so if we have, any quasi cycle then we obtain this bounded two cycle So this is in the, uh, so I didn't add the notation here, maybe I should have, but uh, this, these are the, um, this is uh, ZK gamma, the cocycles modulo and this bounded modulo, and then the, the co-boundary is the ZK. Right, so this cocycle is in this ZK. So we have this natural map from uh, from quasi cocycles to two co bound, bounded two cocycles, and then we can think: What does it mean to be? Uh, what does it mean to be a co-boundary in this sense? Well, to be a co-boundary just means so if if delta one of Q is a co-boundary. So then delta one of Q is equal to delta one of some Q tilde where Q tilde is bounded. But what does that mean? That means that the difference of Q and Q, Q tilde, uh, we have delta one is equal to zero and that's just the co-cycle relation. So IE Q minus Q tilde uh, is a cocycle, a one cocycle. But perhaps unbounded. Uh, so in other words, here we can see that uh, quasi one cocycles modulo uh, bounded bounded functions and modulo genuine cocycles 
give us a non-trivial cohomology, a non-trivial element of bounded truth. So IE, what's the takeaway from this is that uh, therefore, if we look at, I'll say QC tilde maybe. So this is the uh, set of quasi cycles. Those cycles modulo um, bounded functions, so L infinity of gamma with B, plus genuine cocycles. Cocycles. Uh, so this is uh, naturally, so this space QC naturally embeds into H2 B gamma. Uh, so we get this. So this is one excellent source for how we can get non-trivial bounded two cycles is by finding non-trivial quasi cycles which by non-trivial we mean they aren't bounded with distance away from a genuine cycle. Uh, so let me give you, uh, yeah. So before we do examples of this, there are some very easy examples that you can construct them this way. Um, let me rephrase this whole setup and pray in terms of a uh, homogeneous setting. So here I want to talk about the homogeneous chain complex. So here the setting is uh, similar. So we still have, uh, we still have B a Banach gamma module. But now we have an extra, so an extra piece of data. We have an action of gamma on a set. And so gamma x on x, where x is a set. Or you might consider the case where it's a measure space or a measure space. Or you might consider the case where it's a, a topological space, locally compact. You can adapt it to your setting, but just for an action on a set, we already get something. Uh, so then what we can do, we can create a similar chain complex we did before. Uh, so now we define here, first we look at B gamma. So these are the gamma fixed points in the Bonnach space. And then I'm gonna define this operator uh, partial zero, and this is gonna give us L infinity of values from gamma, uh, sorry, not gamma, but x. L infinity of x taking values in b, but I'll insist that they're gamma equivariant. So that's what I'll use this notation for. This means functions which are gamma equivariant. And then we'll have some partial one. And this is going to map into uh, x times x taking values in b. And again, gamma equivariant here. And then you just keep going. And this is where uh, I'll write them here. Where uh, L infinity of of x to the k be this. By what I mean by this is that these are equivariant functions. So let me be explicit. So these are all functions that are bounded from x k to b, uh, such that uh, F at T X one, T X two. So we consider the diagonal action T X K should be equal to T times F of X one, X two to X K. All right, so this is what I mean by these equivariant uh, functions. And then the co-boundary operators I'm going to consider here are, are a bit easier to describe. So this partial uh, k of f. So this is now going to take a function of k variables and give you a k plus one, a function of k plus one variables. And so x1, xk. This is defined to be. This is a bit easier to describe. You just 
again, take an alternating sum, and each time you just forget one of the variables. So this is f of, first you forget the first variable, x1, x2, xk, and then minus uh, f of x not, and then you forget x1, so xk, and then plus, and then et cetera, until you're finally at uh, plus negative one to the uh, k f of x zero up to x minus one. Or there's more compact notation. We can write this as the sum as i goes from zero to k of negative one to the i, and then f of x naught and then we'll write x i hat, meaning we leave out that variable. And it's just this alternating sum where you forget one of the variables each time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so then you can also check, in fact, here it's easier to check, in fact, that you still have delta k times delta k minus one as the zero operator. Um, this is, uh, easy exercise to check. And so you can therefore get these uh, corresponding uh, H bounded cohomology for HN. So this is for gamma acting on X with values in B is going to be exactly the kernel of uh, N plus one modulo the image. Uh, and so one thing about this is this is kind of nice because of course the the, the co-boundary operator is, is fairly simple to define. Um, and you see the action comes into place in these spaces since we restrict these spaces of equivariant functions. So that's where the action comes into place here. And the nice thing about this is of course this cohomology you can define for any any uh, action on a set, or like I said, you could take measure spaces and then replace little L infinity with big L infinity, or you could take topological spaces and then consider continuous bounded functions, maybe separately continuous bounded functions, etc. So there's greater flexibility here. Uh, but actually in the case, so the example uh, where the X is equal to gamma, uh, with left multiplication. So then you get that these uh, bounded cohomologies, so these homogeneous uh, spaces from, is exactly the same or naturally isomorphic to the bounded cohomology spaces I introduced before. Uh, in fact, there's a very natural uh, function which takes you one to the other. So this is a more general setup here with this whole homogeneous chain complex. And in fact, let me give you the explicit uh, function giving the isomorphism here, uh, but I'll have to go to the next page. So specifically, so here we have the homogeneous situation, and here we have the inhomogeneous situation, which is what I gave first. Uh, and if you have here, so the, the map that you're going to take here is here you're going to map L infinity of functions on n plus one variables, but they're going to be gamma equivariant. And over here, you're going to have L infinity of n variables, but not necessarily equivariant. And the mapping you're going to take is so if you have here a uh, function here, you're going to send it to this function f uh, hat, which is going to be defined as follows so x1, x2, xn. And you're just going to define this to be f1, x1, x1, x2, x1, x2, x3, f2, x1, x2. Etc. So if you have an equivariant function here, then this certainly gives you a function on n, n variables. 
Uh, and then you can check that this, well, and let me tell you how to go back the other way. So if you have F over here, or maybe let me use G. So if you have G over here, then you send it to uh, maybe G til tilde, where G tilde at uh, X naught, X one up to X N. So that's a bunch of N plus one variables. And this is equal to X naught times G, X naught inverse X one, X1 inverse X2, X2 inverse X3, et cetera, up to X e minus one inverse X. And then uh, I'll leave it to you guys to check. And this is a very routine uh, computation, but it's maybe good to do uh, once in your life. That when you consider these two, two maps, first of all, they're um, their uh, bijections. Uh, and then the other thing to check is that the, they convert the co-boundary operators from one to the other. So in other words, that if you take um, this delta of f hat, this is going to be exactly uh, partial of f hat. And also, if you take the partial of g tilde or partial of g tilde, partial of g tilde, this is going to be nothing but uh, delta of g. So you can just check these relationships. Uh, and so with this, this gives us the explicit then isomorphism between uh, these two cohomologies, the homogeneous case or the inhomogeneous case. All right, so yeah, on Monday, I'll, I'll give you some explicit examples of quasi-co-cycles on free groups that, that are due to Brooks, uh, where you can explicitly check that they're non-trivial. So there'll be some hands-on material here. And eventually, what, uh, so this, this is what we're going to establish. So we'll show, here's the, the preview of what's to come is we're gonna show that um, bounded cohomology of free groups uh, for any Hilbert space, but specifically we'll be interested in the L2 space because um, that has nicer properties. Uh, so we'll show that this is not equal to zero. We'll do that on Monday and then we'll use this to show that actually this, this property holds for any acylindrically hyperbolic group, uh, which, we'll, which we'll also introduce next.